since I'm talking to, uh, so most people here don't, are not very familiar with uh, my subject matter, I'll uh, perhaps start directly uh, with the problem at hand uh, and then backtrack to tell you uh, where it came from. All right, so the, I'll start with the objects which I am playing. Uh, so the number fields, uh, then global function fields, and more generally function fields uh, of transcendence degree one over arbitrary constant fields. Of course, this is a bit uh, misleading because the constant fields are arbitrary, so the total transcendence degree could be arbitrary. Um, and uh, I will be uh, discussing non-Archimedean discrete valuations. So for our purposes, it's uh, just a map uh, from uh, a product forming field into Z plus infinity, um, satisfying the usual conditions. And uh, if K happens to be a function field, um, then we will assume that the valuation is trivial on the constant field. So, um, so the value uh, of the valuation is zero. Okay, so then um, <clears throat> the valuation rings, that's just the rings of elements of the field where the value of the valuation is positive. That ring has a unique maximal ideal. Uh, sorry, so the ring is the set of all elements where the valuation is non negative and the ideal is the will consist of all the elements um, uh, of the array which, uh, where valuation has a positive value and we will often identify the valuation with the ideal. So if we mod out by the ideal, we get the residue fields. In the case of a function field, it's always a finite extension of the field of constants. Uh, and if this extension is actually degree one, we say that the valuation is of degree one. Um, we will also look at integral closures of variation rings in the infinite algebraic extensions of our product formula fields. Well, some of them. Okay, so what's the problem? Uh, so let K be a product formula field or its infinite algebraic extension K infinity. So first for the product formula field itself, we would be looking for a polynomial, so FV, which has uh, M variables and a parameter T, um, such that uh, the sentence where EI is uh, sub-quantified, so either for every or there exists, uh, so that the sentence is true if and only if T belongs to some intersection of valuation rings uh, for some set of valuation, uh, valuations of the field. Uh, obviously, often we will just look at one valuation ring, but in principle, we'll look we can look at arbitrary number. And uh, <clears throat> we will look also into defining the integral closure of our valuation rates um, in an infinite algebraic extension. So these are the two problems which will come up um, often in our talk. Um, so, this question is a part of a more general uh, series of questions which has to do with um, language of rings. So that's the language we all uh, use and basically um, it's the language which underlies uh, statements which are essentially polynomial equation. So you start from zero and one, of course you can get all the integers by iterating addition, um, and you also have multiplication. You have logical connectives, um, but in general you can rewrite any sentence, a formula of this sort, pulling all quantifiers in front. So I will only be concerned about sentences or formulas where um, all the quantifiers are, are pulled out just to simplify life. Uh, so, uh, let's see, where am I? So, this is uh, a typical formula of the language. So, some variables are bound by quantifiers, some are not. Um, and of course, if every, oops, 
Uh, and of course, uh, if all the variables are within the range of some quantifier, you get a sentence, so, which is either true or false. Um, so, the general problem, uh, definability problem for a countable ring, just, you can also consider uncountable rings, you just have to be more careful, um, is to see if there is an algorithm to determine whether a sentence uh, of this ring language is true or false. Of course, it's all going to depend on the ring. And also, what is the uh, power of the language? In other words, what can one define using this language? So, um, quantifiers may range over the whole ring or a subset of the ring. Sometimes we want just existential quantifiers or just universal quantifiers or we limit the number of certain quantifiers. So there's an infinite variety of questions there. Okay. All right, so where does it all come from? I mean, why do people study these things? Well, there are some you know, aesthetical reasons, obviously, and also historical ones. So one uh, point of departure was the Hilbert's test problem, which was a question about algorithmic solvability of polynomial equations. So that was posed uh, circa 1900. And, uh, of course, at the time there was no uh, notion of the algorithm, so this is a modern restatement of the problem. Um, and then there was another result, uh, which is somewhere between uh, the listed references. I was never able to pin down exactly which one contains what, but it's somewhere in there. So, um, which uh, showed, so that result showed that the first order theory of um, integers is undecidable. In other words, given so there is no algorithm to determine um, whether a sentence of this sort, where again e sub i is just universal or existential quantifiers, um, uh, is true when variables are ranging over z. So, so that was the first kind of definability type result um, I was talking about earlier. Um, then, uh, I guess proceeding chronologically, Julia Robinson um, showed that Z is definable by a first order formula over Q, so that's using universal and existential quantifiers, and so the first order theory of Q in the language of rings is also undecidable. And um, later on, she extended her results to uh, all number fields. Now, finally, the question of Hilbert was answered in uh, 1970. The last piece was put in by Yuri Matusevich, uh, building on work of Martin Davis, Hilary Putnam, and Julia Robinson. But they actually proved a much stronger definability results. They showed that all recursively enumerable subsets of Z are the same as the De Fontaine sets. So recursive sets, or uh, for our purposes, will be subsets of, oh, I didn't say, uh, subsets of integers uh, where we have an algorithm to determine membership of the set. So, or a program, if you wish, to um, determine membership in the set. Uh, then there's another class of sets which are recursively enumerable. So a subset is called recursively enumerable if there is an algorithm to list the elements of the set. Now the listing can go on forever if the set is infinite. And it's a classical theorem of recursion theory that there are recursively enumerable sets that are not recursive. So da Fontaine sets are the sets which one can define using polynomial equations. Uh, so this is sort of more traditional number theoretic versions. So, or as I, you can also see that those sets as projections of algebraic sets, or as I said, as existentially definable in language of rings. Um, so what followed from uh, Marty Savage, Davis, Robinson, and Potnam Potter result is that there are undecidable uh, Diophantine subsets of Z. Uh, that immediately implied that Hilbert's depth problem was undecidable. So, or positive existential theory of Z is undecidable. Positive here refers to the fact that we only consider equalities 
we're not looking at uh, statements which say that something is not equal to something else. We will deal with that shortly. But, um, it's easy to see uh, how this corollary will arise. Uh, so consider a Fontaine definition of undecidable set. If uh, Hilbert's tense problem is decidable, then for each t, we can determine if the polynomial f t x bar equals zero has solutions of z. However, this process will also determine uh, whether t is an element of our uh, undecidable set, which of course produces a contradiction. Now, um, before proceeding further, some uh, brief notes on some elementary properties of Diophantine sets. So intersections and unions of Diophantine sets are Diophantine unions always just uh, multiply out the Fontaine definitions. Intersections are the Fontaine uh, over not algebraically closed fields because uh, in order to write the Fontaine definitions of intersections, we need to combine polynomials and that requires um, the field not to be algebraically closed. I mean, if we wanted to omit that condition, we would have to allow uh, finite systems of equations instead of one polynomial equation. And so as long as the field is not algebraically closed, having one equation of finitely many is the same thing. And here's an important uh, property of um, the Fontaine definition, in particular over Z, and in general uh, over all integrally closed subrings of number fields and, well, global fields, I think. And um, their algebraic extension is that the sets of non-zero elements are Di Fontaine. So that property allows us to um, actually write down that something is not equal to something else. Okay, so you can ask an arbitrary, so you can take an arbitrary recursive ring R, and by recursive ring here I just mean a ring where you can tell who the elements are and how to do multiplication and addition. And then you can ask, well, is there a polynomial to determine whether this equation has solutions in R? And as it stands now, the two most prominent questions are probably the uh, issue of decidability of this version of Hilbert's tense problem over Q and the ranks of integers of an arbitrary number field. Okay, this uh, slide is to eliminate uh, confusion which often arises when people think about Q versus Z for a long time. So, uh, it goes easily one way, but not the other. So, if, uh, in other words, if we have, an al if we had an algorithm over Z, we would have an algorithm over Q by just rewriting all the rational numbers as ratios of integers and requiring that denominators are not zero. This is where we would use the fact that um, the set of non-zero elements is that Fontaine. So, uh, perhaps Hilbert thought that uh, that algorithm existed and uh, he stated, quote unquote, the harder problem. But it doesn't go the other way. The fact that there is no uh, algorithm over Z at least not, does not at least directly say anything about Q. So. All right, so one old uh, method of showing that um, Hilbert's tense problem is undecidable over some ring of characteristic zero is constructing a Diophantine definition of Z of the ring. Uh, so this is a quick proof that that will do the job. So suppose you had such a Diophantine definition of some ring R, so, and you wanted to know whether your polynomial H um, have solutions uh, in Z. So you would set up a system uh, over your ring R and observe that the system has solutions in your ring even on the if the original equation has solutions in Z. So uh, since we don't have an algorithm to determine whether polynomial H has solutions in Z, it follows that um, we don't have an algorithm to solve our system in R. So in general, we don't have an algorithm for solving polynomial equations in R. Um, so before proceeding further, let me just quickly say what 
uh, valuations we have over Q. So we identify them generally with prime numbers and uh, uh, define the valuation via the order function in an obvious fashion. Uh, and then the valuation ring R sub P corresponds uh, to the set of all elements of Q whose reduced denominator is not divisible by P. Now we can rephrase the problem of defining, defining Z inside Q via Diffontaine definition as a problem of defining an existentially intersection of all valuation rings. All right, so unfortunately, uh, this is probably not going to work. And that's a conjecture of Baris, which has an unfortunate um, consequence. Uh, and uh, just rephrasing our problem in terms of intersection evaluation ring doesn't add much to our knowledge about the matter. Now, um, we can also look at so, partial intersection evaluation rings. So um, just select a subset of prime numbers and look at um, intersection uh, of primes in that set. So for those rings, you also have a problem of whether Z is definable over those rings and whether the rings themselves are definable over Q. And as it stands now, we can define Z only if we invert finitely many uh, primes and we can define the ring from Q only if we invert all but finitely many primes. So these results are actually, were actually contained in the original work of Julia Robinson, though she was not, at the time, interested in existential definability. She was looking at first-order definition. But uh, in the process of doing that, she did uh, uh, produce these two results, and it took us actually some time to realize that these results were there. So another way to show our decidability uh, of first-order existential theory is to construct a model of the theory of a ring in question. So you can map uh, an integer into some subset of the ring. So the uh, union of all such set has to be definable and so should be the uh, graphs of addition and multiplication. <coughs> all right, so what else can one do if you have um, a definition of a valuation ring? Um, okay, so if we're looking at number fields, then we can also identify um, valuations of a number field with uh, prime ideals. So just uh, look at the ring of integers uh, of the field and use order again to define the valuation. Um, so here's a result of more or less result of Poonin. I mean, I say more or less because it's kind of a restatement of what he did. So the difference being uh, that uh, he put the neutral element of an elliptic curve at, the, at infinity. Personally, I prefer to put it at zero. It um, <coughs> makes, at least for me, easier to understand what's going on. Um, so uh, elliptic curves were one of the devices uh, used to generate sets of integers for the purposes of constructing a Diophantine definition of Z of a ring in question. I mean, in general, you could be looking at any kind of uh, group you can define. So, but elliptic curves perhaps are um, one of the first um, uh, objects that come to mind in this connection. And um, so the trick is to make the coordinates be uh, divisible by sufficiently high um, order uh, power of the prime in question, and then the last, yes. So the this last inequality provides a way to generate integers. So, so, um, so this. Uh, so this is sort of an example of, of an application of this kind. Consider an infinite algebraic extension of a number field and assume you happen to have an elliptic curve which is Diophantine stable and of positive rank. 
In other words, the set of points uh, over the infinite extension is the same as over number field. Um, just for convenience sake, I will assume it's normal, though norm, you know, I in general you don't need this requirement, but just makes explanation uh, simpler. So, the claim would be that um, if you have a, a, a sentence uh, that for every y and k infinity, so there are points p and q on the elliptic curve, such that that ratio belongs to uh, the integral closure uh, of some prime from the, uh, from, belongs to the integral closure of some variation ring from k, then x would have to be in k. And the second claim is that um, if x happens to be a positive integer, then the sentence will be true for x. So there are only, as you see, um, well, there are two variables and they're also quantify attached to p and q. So strictly speaking, of course, you would rewrite it in terms of other variables, but it's easier to think about it this way. So, why so? Um, the ultimate reason is that uh, given an element of, of uh, well, any element of algebraic closure of Q, it will live in some number field, and it will be, you know, its order at any prime is going to be finite. So that's the underlying reason for, um, for why this works. Uh, on a more sort of specific basis, so uh, you just look, okay, so take an element x from your infinite extension and look at some number field containing a regional field and that element x and um, uh, take its uh, Galois closure inside the k infinity and pick a conjugate, any conjugate of your element x. Now, uh, since uh, this expression, the sentence, had to be true for any y um, in k infinity, we can assume that y is in k for the moment. And then you observe then, of course, if, the, um, if that expression is an rp infinity for x, the same happens for x hat. Um, so then, um, if you take any prime above your chosen prime p in m, then uh, from the expressions two and three, you'll see that order of the difference between x and its conjugate over k has to be bigger or equal to that order uh, of y and q. But y was an arbitrary element of k, so the only way this can happen for any y is for x hat to be equal to x. And since x hat was an arbitrary conjugate of x over k, we can conclude that uh, x and k, so it's not a very complicated argument. Okay, so, um, and then the other part of it is that um, you can satisfy the condition if you're starting with an integer, and uh, basically you just choose uh, p to be a multiple, I'm not sure if I wrote them backwards, but, oh no, that's okay. Um, take a multiple of your point and then the um, things should work out. So let me go back and just remind you. They will work out because of five. So, so then uh, the order at the difference will be bigger equal than the order at P, um, which in general can be made uh, arbitrary, but in particular we just need it um, to be positive. Uh, we need it, uh, I guess, depends on y, so uh, we need it to be bigger than the order of y at p, so, but we can arrange that. So, so if we choose p with large enough order, and then the corresponding multiple of p, this will work. Um, now, why is it enough to just define um, order of positive integers? Well, I mean, we observe, of course, that um, any element of k k 
can be written down as a linear combination of some basis elements in K over Q, with coefficients in Q, and all elements of Q are ratios of integers. So in fact, what we have is a first-order definition of K over K infinity. So we can now use the result of Julia Robinson stating that the first order theory of any number field is undecidable and then reach the conclusion that the first order theory of k-infinity is undecidable because within um, the statements of k-infinity we now have all the statements about k. All right, so the next question, of course, uh, do we have such elliptic curves? We do, we do, and whether they actually happen uh, over the fields where we can define variations. So yes, we have lots and lots of examples, but uh, not yet a definitive description of what class of fields would be covered by these results. All right, moving on to um, function fields. Um, so we uh, again have um, a very similar situation with variations. So most of them, you know, we choose some polynomial ring inside, uh, in this case, our rational field, then all the variation will correspond to prime ideals, except the variation attached to degree, which will correspond to an ideal in K um, adjoint 1 over T. Uh, and then we have a similar story in algebraic extensions as before. The difference with, of course, with number fields is that um, there is no designated rank of integral functions, so, uh, but it doesn't matter. The definition will work either way. So we take the integral closure of our original polynomial ring and then all the valuations will come from prime ideals of that, except of course the valuation which used to be the degree. So that will come from the integral closure, from some prime ideals of the integral closure of K adjoint one over T. Okay, so um, there are a couple of results which on the surface are not related to anything I've been talking about, but that play a role together with the definition of valuations um, in, uh, in uh, investigation of the first order existential theory uh, of function fields. One of these things is the result of Julia Robinson on addition and divisibility. So, so here we do not have a language of rings, we have kind of a minimum minimized version of it. So we're missing multiplication, and instead of my multiplication, we have divisibility. So we can say that something divides something else. So if we deploy all possible quantifiers, then we can define multiplication in this language. Now then there is another result, which is due to feed us. Um, so this time, um, we have so the same language as Julia Robinson had, and we also have a peculiar relation, so where x p divides y is equivalent to x being y times the power of some prime, fixed prime. So um, if you have this kind of a language, you can define multiplication existentially, so just using existential quantifiers of z. All right, so what has that to do with function fields? Um, so if uh, we can define, uh, oh, this is, there is a typo there. So set P should be set of P to the S powers. In other words, Y should be X to the power of P to the S, not X times P to the S. So in other words, if we can uh, describe the set uh, yeah, of P to the S powers of all elements of the field. So, if you just have description, a first order description of P, then you can construct a first order model of Z using um, Julia Robinson's result. 
Now, if you also have um, a Diophantine definition of some valuation ring, then you will have um, an existential model of Z um, over your field, and then you will show that Hilbert's tenth problem is not decidable in the field. Uh, I guess in principle this could be used over function fields of characteristic zero, but uh, it seems to be only practical uh, of a function. Uh, but it seems only practical to do of uh, function fields of positive characteristic. So, using these two ideas, uh, Kirsten and I uh, showed that the first order theory in the language of the rings of any function field of positive characteristic is undecidable, and the existential theory in, in the language of rings of any function field of positive characteristic is undecidable as long as the field does not contain the algebraic closure of a finite field. Now, uh, we can define the pith powers everywhere, and uh, actually Hector has a definition which does not depend on the characteristic, but the problem is the order. Okay, so as far as the uh, open questions about valuations are concerned, so, um, so one of them is to define fully uh, valuation rings in the case where the constant field is not algebraic or a finite field. Uh, what we did to get um, our existential undecidability result was to define a subset of that valuation ring and that was enough. But it would be nice to be able to, ref to define the complete valuation rate. And of course, the $1,000 question is uh, to define a valuation ring um, when the constant field is you know, contains the algebraic closure of a finite field. So those things are mysterious as it stands now. Um, okay, so what happens when we look at function fields of characteristic zero? We use elliptic curves again. So uh, here we um, can get away with one, just with one prime, because uh, Z will be part of the constant field. Um, so if we can define, so if we have an elliptic curve of rank one, and uh, if we can define um, the valuation ring, then we can construct uh, an existential uh, model of Z. Well, depending if you have a first order definition of the valuation ring, you'll get the first order undecidability. And if you have an existential definition, you'll get um, the existential undecidability. Okay, now we have plenty of elliptic curves of rank one, so they exist everywhere. So that's not a problem. What, uh, so what is a problem is defining valuation rings. So there is, the first result of this kind uh, was by Kim and Rauch, so in 1995. Um, so they defined valuation rings for the prime of degree one when the constant field was either formally real or can be um, embedded into a finite extension of QP. Now, uh, this paper has been used and cited a million of times, but I'm willing to bet no one reads for this completely because the paper is completely unreadable. <laughs> so. However, okay, so um, we do have, so we do now have a, a, a better version of the proof, so there are high hopes. Now, um, so uh, Kirsten and Laura Bailly, uh they independently constructed an existential definition of a subset of a valuation ring in an algebraic extension. So, that allowed them to show that uh, existential theory of um, finite extensions of a uh, rational field is undecidable, assuming the field of constants were as described in the theorem of Kim and Rauch. And um, I 
after writing Kim and Rausch, finally uh, constructed an existential definition of evaluation ring for an arbitrary prime and a finite extension of, K, uh, of uh, uh, KT. Uh, but we should be able to do more than in the Kim and Rausch theorem, but uh, it hasn't been done more. But okay, so. Uh, so the open questions for um, function fields of characteristic zero so is to figure out when the evaluation rings are definable, existentially, of first order. And again, um, the $1,000 question here is uh, what happens when the field of constants is algebraically closed. So, this is so bad that we don't know anything about even first order theory of uh, the rational field. So if you take an algebraic closure of Q or C, uh, T, I, we don't know anything about those fields. So, uh, and yeah, the problem being that the field is algebraically closed and we do not know how to define valuations uh, in those cases. Okay, and of course, if we if it happens to be the case that valuation rings are not definable and actually there is no firm belief one way or the other about this, about this question. So then we of course would have to find another method for showing that the corresponding function fields have undecidable existential or first order theory. I guess we believe that the theory will be undecidable just something else would have to be done. Now I must say that if the transcendence degree of the constant field is greater than one, like you have two or more variables, then uh, we know that we have results which say that uh, it's due first to Kim and Rausch and then to Kirsten that uh, the uh, theory is undecidable, existential theory is undecidable, and that method does bypass the definition of order. So we might have to do something like that for, ah, for algebraic, so for Q tilde, where Q tilde is algebraic closure of Q adjoint T or CT. So. All right, so how is it done? Well, in general, it's a pretty nasty exercise. I will just give you some ideas of sort of where the story begins. And also there are many variations on the theme. Um, I think the original method goes back to Julia Robinson, who used quadratic forms, and I will show you in a second the idea behind it. Um, but first, some sort of elementary observation. So if you um, have, so let's, Okay, so um, we can reduce the question of whether something in the evaluation ring to uh, divisibility of water by a given prime. So let's say P is a prime whose valuation ring we're seeking to define, and Q is some other rational prime. Now if you look uh, at this expression, so order P of A is one, so that's crucial. And if, we, if you look at the expression, and this is also one of many variations on the theme, uh, expression is x to the q over a plus 1 over a to the q's power. It's easy to see that it's equivalent to 0 mod q if and only if um, x is integral at p. So indeed, if x is the order of x uh, at p is bigger or equal to 0, uh, and then the uh, order of x q over a is bigger or equal to minus 1, and the second term, one, 1 over a q, will dominate. So the order of the sum will be minus q, which is, of course, 0 mod q. However, if order of x at p is less than 0, then the first term will dominate the situation, and the order will not be um, 0 mod q. Okay. Now, so this is uh, the original quadratic form uh, used by Julia Robinson and reused on many occasions ever since. Okay, so this form, um, 
over Q, let's say, is anisotropic, if and only if, if there exists a prime P such that order of B at P is odd and C is not a square mod P, or the other way around, since the form is clearly symmetric in B and C. So, uh, fix a prime P and C this is not equivalent to square mod P, and again, let order of A at P be 1, and substitute for B the expression we were talking about. So, um, then this equation has no trivial, the, the form equation has no trivial solution, um, then order of B at P must be even, and therefore order of X at P must be bigger or equal to zero. Um, so that is uh, the easy part. The um, messy part is to uh, make sure that we do have non-trivial solutions to our form equation if um, our x is integral at p. Okay, so the main um, tool here is Hasse-Minkowski local global principle. So basically to show that we have non-trivial solutions, we have to make sure that we have non-trivial solution in every completion. But fortunately, it's usually not that big of a deal, basically because of Hansel's lemma. And so, but you have to muck around. Sometimes you end up with a couple equations, you do something to coefficients. Um, and again, there are plenty of variations on the theme, but that's generally what people do. Um, questions? Okay. Now, uh, you can rewrite the form equation, the quadratic form equation, to see that you're actually looking at a norm equation, norm of degree two. And once you observe this, it can occur to you that actually it would be useful to get away from degree two because there are situations where degree two is not desirable. For example, when you're working in characteristic two, or when you're in an infinite extension and the local degrees of factors of P are divisible by arbitrarily high powers of two. So Romley was the first person to um, I guess make this observation. He was working over uh, global function fields and uh, he set up a norm equation um, to uh, define order. So then, of course, instead of Hasse-Minkowski, you use Hasse norm principle um, to make sure the equations are satisfied um, when C does not uh, have a negative order at P. And again, it's the same story. Uh, you just look at things locally, and you might end up with a couple of norm equations to account for all the possibilities. But locally, things are easier because of Hansel's lemma. Okay, I'll stop here.